again, a geriatrician with the Department of Geriatric Medicine at JAPSUM. I serve as the course director and facilitator of this series, and our purpose is the, to empower the healthcare providers in the community to deliver age-friendly healthcare. Next slide. A little bit about ECHO. Um, this um, serves as a mutual teaching and learning from experts from each of us and the front lines. And so as the ECHO model goes, it's all teach, all learn. So it will take all of you to create this community of learning. And so, yeah, we, we love to interact, you know, unmute and type in the chat box and, um, and we'll all share. Number three. So the way it works is that we have a short lecture from our, our experts, and then we will share expertise from the rest of our interdisciplinary team, and then open up for a time of case discussions. We invite you to share any geriatric cases, um, and it may not necessarily be on a topic related to today's lecture. Our interdisciplinary team is willing to teach and share our collective wisdom with you. We only ask that you keep everything HIPAA compliant for the case discussion. Next slide. We commit to maintaining confidentiality, so HIPAA compliant. We also we want to create a safe learning environment, and you know foster a culture of mutual learning and encouragement, so no negativity or shame or anything like that. We've all seen challenging cases before, you know, and nobody's going to pretend to be an expert. Uh, just the caveat that Echo case consultations do not create or otherwise establish provider-patient relationships. Um, for the cases being discussed in this setting. Next slide. And I'm sure everybody knows about Zoom and how to use it. There is a chat box on the corner, on the left-hand corner somewhere. Uh, so make sure you click on the chat tool, enter your name and uh, whatever organization you're in. And that is our way of taking attendance and seeing who's here. Um, and then there's also a mute button. And I just wanna make sure that everybody uh, clicks and make sure you're on mute if you're not speaking and feel free to unmute whenever you want to speak. Next slide. So this is our calendar. We run the series on the second Wednesday of each month from 12 to one o'clock and it's a one hour session and we offer continuing education credits for doctors, nurses and social work. So this is our calendar for the next few months. We've, this, you can see the topics we've covered in the past and um, next month, we're gonna be doing dry ice. So keep coming back. Next slide. Hello, so um, the CME activity is sponsored by the Hawaii Consortium of Continuing Medical Education uh, through Hawaii Medical Association and JAPSUM. And uh, there's also CE credits for social workers. But as a reminder, you have to complete an evaluation form in order to receive the continuing education credits or certificates of attendance. The evaluations can be found on our website under the evaluations tab, um, or actually we'll um, have it put into the chat box just shortly uh, before we end and they could just click on it and just do the evaluation right away. Next slide. I just want to introduce our hub team. So there's me and then we have Mary Gottam she is a retired public health nurse with decades of experience in public health nursing. Um, and Sarah Tomkison, she's a licensed clinical social work with uh, also decades of experience in geriatrics, mental health, long-term care, and has served in many, many um, um, practice sites, VA, Hale Kawike, Central <coughs> Union Adult Day Care. And also she's been in the community and she knows it really well. Um, uh, and uh, so next slide, oh, actually just uh, so you notice, uh, part of the introductions is that uh, you need to type your name in the chat box. Uh, and if there are people in the room attending with you who, um, uh, uh, who are viewing the same screen in the chat box, you should type in your name and other, uh, other, other people in the, in the room with you. Okay, next slide. Okay, and so today, we are going to introduce Dr. Ray Seitz. She is a Harvard-trained palliative medicine specialist who led the development of home-based palliative care on behalf of both Kaiser and HMSA. She is an educator and a speaker about palliative medicine and palliative care in Hawaii, nationally and internationally. 
In 2013, she was recognized as one of the 30 visionaries in palliative care by the Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, and she remains committed to expanding the capacity for high quality palliative care in Hawaii. So uh, she's the current chair of Hui Pohala. It's a collaborative committed to making palliative care available to everyone in Hawaii with serious illness. So, so in spite of retirement, there's no stopping her. She is a force to be reckoned with and we're glad for it. And I hope, I don't know if Jeanette is on the line, but she is joining us as well from Kokua Mau. Both speakers have disclosed that they do not have any relationships with commercial supporters that could be perceived as a conflict of interest in the context of this presentation. So without further ado, I'll let Ray Seitz take it away. Thanks, Saida. I see, um, you know, in the, in the chat box, a lot of people who are um, expert at a lot of this stuff and um, people with whom I've had the great good fortune of collaborating with um, over the years. So really, any of you have any questions, comments, um, anything that you think I, I miss or I get wrong and you want to add or correct, please be feel completely free to do so. Um, so while I have no financial disclosures to make, unfortunately, um, I do want to point out something. Can I get the next slide, please? And that is that I chair a new organization called Hui Pohala. Um, and you can see here that um, we are dedicated to expanding access to palliative care. So my bias uh, is one that I have to share with you. I believe very strongly that um, high quality palliative care for many people with serious illness uh, really represents best care that we uh, can provide for people. Next slide, please. And if anybody's interested in Hui Pohala, my Hui Pohala um, email will be at the end of this and uh, you should feel free to reach out. Today, we're going to um, just quickly review the definitions of serious illness and palliative care. I like to do this because um, it, it kind of helps level set uh, and people can kind of think about things from a common place um, as opposed to whatever happens to pop into our heads at any given point in time. Um, I'll describe at least three models of care for management of serious illness that we have here in Hawaii. Um, and uh, you may want to jot down, you know, some of the, the details of this because you may find that you have a, a, a client or a, a member who you think could benefit from one of these programs. And then I, I, um, I want you to walk away with at least two um, things that you can point to as an important difference between palliative care and hospice care, because the two are often um, um, confused. Uh, They're thought of as the same thing, and et cetera. Next slide, please. So let's start with um, a real life person. This is Iris, 69-year-old librarian. Prior to getting sick, she had excellent functional status. She was able to work full time, live independently. She could uh, get herself to wherever she needed to go. But unfortunately, she uh, was diagnosed with stage four cervical cancer. She had severe pain, which her uh, providers really struggled unsuccessfully to get on a, under control. It was so bad that she couldn't even sit in the chemo chair long enough for the infusions of her chemotherapy. So she's not unlike, I think, a lot of people we've met over the years. Um, and when you look at her options for care, um, there, there are many. And so let's explore some of those. Next slide, please. But before we get into what kind of care she could get, um, let's talk a little bit about what is serious illness? Because when you look at somebody like Iris, it feels like she has a serious illness, right? Stage four, cervical cancer, that's not good. Um, not curable at that stage. But what exactly is serious illness? Uh, the definition I'd like to use was crafted by Dr. Amy Kelly, and it is a 
um, definition that many uh, organizations and agencies have decided to use. So National Institutes of Health, uh, Center to Advance Palliative Care, et cetera. This is the definition that they use. It's a health condition that carries a high risk of mortality and negatively impacts daily functioning or quality of life or excessively strains his or her caregivers. So you see, they're not saying that it's terminal. They're not saying the person is going to die. What they say is that it is serious enough that it does uh, pose a risk to the life of the patient. And with that, that the condition negatively impacts their functioning or quality of life. And this is a key one too, or excessively strains his or her caregivers. Because we know that as people struggle to maintain independence and their functioning and quality of life, sometimes the effort to get there really is um, a heavy burden on the, the patient or his or her caregivers. Next slide, please. And we also know that it, it, it can uh, financially strain uh, these people to the point of bankruptcy. Okay, so how do, how do we care for people with serious illness? We've had them around ever since we've had people around. Well, there's usual medical care, we'll go through that. Um, and that is changing even as we speak. The health plans are struggling to figure out how are they going to use the monies they have in appropriate ways to care for people with serious illness. Various agencies have begun to look at um, a more broad definition of people that they might um, care for. For example, hospice agencies are trying to move um, care earlier in the course of serious illness, not just at the very end of life. The VA is looking at how they can uh, provide care, better care. And of course, there are uh, palliative care programs. Uh, the best example, I think, for Hawaii at this point in time is supportive care. Next slide, please. So what is usual care. What happens usually happens in usual care? Well, uh, you know, the term many of us use is fractured care. Things are broken, things are mismatched, there are misalignments. This is usually how things happen. So first of all, while you're well, um, pretty much, the PCP can manage your care. You can call them, you can make an appointment, what have you. Um, but when you develop a serious condition like Iris did, the PCP is not equipped to deal with that, right? They don't have the knowledge and the skills and uh, the certifications to give medications or, or treatments. So they refer to appropriate specialists. And sometimes there's more than one specialist that a patient has to be referred to. But suddenly this patient may find that there are a whole bunch of people who are involved in their care, in their medical care. What we find is that the communication between all of these entities, between all of these treating providers is likely to be less than optimal. I, um, part of what I do at this point in time is I sit on what is called the MICP. And that's a state run um, panel for people who are bringing medical malpractice suits against um, entities or providers. And I'm usually the physician and I partner with a lawyer. And I can tell you 99% of the time, it's communication that is the problem. It is not um, standard of care, but it is how people communicate with one another to make sure that the care of the patient is understood and well-coordinated. That happens between providers so that the right hand might not know what the left hand is doing or they might be um, operating uh, off different goals that they're trying to reach. So there can be a lot of confusion and discoordination um, that leads to that fractured care. Very often patients and caregivers don't understand why things are happening or why um, they uh, are undergoing certain treatments. So, um, there's not enough shared decision making that goes on um, to enable patients to be in the driver's seat of their care. And there's little advanced care planning. What advanced care planning is, that does go on 
uh, unfortunately, very often is ineffective. And we saw that when at HMSA, we decided to uh, incentivize post and uh, advanced and uh, advanced healthcare directives. <clears throat> and we found that we got many more um, documents, but a lot of the information in the documents were uh, not were inconsistent and um, not very useful. And what I found is that a lot of caregivers um, couldn't use what was in the advanced care planning documents. Next slide, please. So this usual care results in usual outcomes and those outcomes are not optimal. Uh, the care that people have under usual medical care at this point in time is largely crisis driven. That means that they appear at the ER doorstep, the, the um, physician's doorstep, the hospital doorstep when they're in a crisis because they don't know how to anticipate what may be coming down the pike for them. They don't know how to manipulate the um, medications or the equipment that they may have in their home. All of this, you know, serious illness is just um, burdened with stress, anxiety, pain, fear, confusion, distress. People are in distress when they have serious illness and something comes up where they have to come into the very complicated medical system to get care. This kind of usual care is costly. 5% of uh, people in the United States account for 70% of healthcare dollars. And that 5%, that's these, that the most of them are these people with serious illness, okay? So if we can better care for people with serious illness, um, we can begin to see better resource utilization. It's not only society as a whole that pays for this kind of suboptimal care, but families pay financially as well. They go bankrupt or they have to dip into the savings of their kids' uh, college funds, et cetera. They have to give up going on vacation. And this was before COVID. Um, so they pay a hefty price. They have to give up jobs or they have to go to part-time. Um, it, it's not a good situation. And all of this, you think, you know, are people happy with these kind of outcomes? No, they're not. Low satisfaction and providers get very um, uh, dissatisfied with this as well because they see um, that perhaps they're not getting the optimal outcomes of the treatments they're working so hard with their patients to um, accomplish. Next slide, please. Just check the chat. Um, okay, Joseph is going to have some things to say. Um, so health plans are interested in managing this group of people because obviously, um, a lot of premium dollars are going to care for these people. So they're trying to figure out how do we, how do we provide better care more effectively to people with serious illness? One of the major ways that health plans look at this and they try to um, meet the needs of patients is by increasing case management. Okay, we all talk about case management. Um, and I, I I have to admit that for a long time, I didn't quite understand what exactly case management was, except it felt like you had a bunch of nurses and maybe some social workers and they, um, they interacted in some way, shape or form with um, a member who had a serious problem. But according to the Commission for the Certification of Case Managers, there's actually um, a um, professional approach to case management. It's an area of specialty within health and human services professions. Um, and it's based on the premise that everyone benefits, everybody benefits, uh, all the stakeholders, when clients can reach their optimum level of wellness, self-management, and functional capability. Sounds really great. But when you have somebody with serious illness, that's a, that's a huge challenge. And the real problem is how do you uh, take these aspirations and uh, operationalize it? And I think that's where sometimes the health plans 
really fall short of their goals. Next slide, please. Um, and, and here's why I say that. Health plans try to build more case management because they think that's a good thing. And for many people, it can be. But in the cases um, that I've seen, the major way that case managers or service coordinators work is by phone. So they may have like, I don't know, let's say 2000 people who by an algorithm um, have been identified as possibly needing case management services. And so you have a bunch of nurses and social workers and they sit and a phone number pops up and they call. Um, that call, you hope, is picked up by somebody because um, for those who work in geriatrics, you know that many older people are not going to pick up the phone. They don't recognize who is calling. They're not going to pick up the phone. They may not hear the phone. And even if they pick up the phone, they may not be able to hear the person on the other side. Um, or they may say, oh, you, you need to talk to my daughter, not me. Um, so managing people by phone who have a serious illness, that's going to be a challenging proposition. And so, um, and, and in this kind of situation, it's a rare case manager um, who work for a health plan who actually have the ability to meet with a, a, a member face-to-face. -face. That's really um, hard for them to do. Their load is just too big. So not only are there many barriers in engaging a patient by phone or a member by phone, but there's also ch challenges of engaging the providers by phone, right? So you have a nurse, she gets this info, let's say she's really lucky and she's great. Um, she uses all her motivational interviewing skills and so on. And she gets all of this great information from the patient. And now what she has to do is talk to the providers. Well, that's a whole other barrier, you know? How's the, they, and for many of them, the, um, the providers say they don't have time to talk to them, um, what have you. Anyway, it's a, it's, it's, it's a difficult way to take care of people with serious illness. It may work for people who are um, perhaps earlier in their disease process, more functional, et cetera. A lot of these um, case managers are just hungry for any kind of um, information, knowledge building, skill building. And so they you know, seek out uh, motivational interviewing training. Um, if their organization is part of CAPSI, CAPSI has um, a lot of training modules. And I know, for example, that case managers from HMSA, they avail themselves of the CAPSI modules at a, at a pretty uh, robust rate. Next, next slide, please. Um, so that's what the health plans try to do, manage people by phone pretty much or remotely. But there are home-based programs too that have been developed. And most of these home-based programs are now coming out of um, the various hospice agencies that we have in our community. And, and I'll tell you that really does my heart good because I think um, that the experience with um, building home-based palliative care with HMSA helped um, the hospices gain information, knowledge, skills, and, um, and, and an appreciation for how they could grow in that, into that direction. Some of these um, home-based programs uh, are staffed by palliative care teams. Some of the home-based programs are staffed by various um, professionals who are, uh, apply palliative care approaches or principles. And we're gonna talk a little bit about what Bristol does, what Navian does, and what uh, the VA does. And if anybody out there has uh, additional information they wanna share about any of these things, please feel free to do so. Next uh, slide, please. Um, okay, so Bristol Hospice uh, has a program called AIM. 
the Advanced Illness Management Program. And the way I look at it is this program is really uh, managed by uh, teams of people who have a whole toolkit full of um, various tools that they can apply in different ways uh, based upon the needs of the people who come before them. So Bristol, like all the other hospices, can provide home-based palliative care for their HMSA members um, via supportive care if they meet the criteria. Obviously, Bristol Hospice has hospice services that they can provide for people who are hospice appropriate and who choose that option. Sometimes people are referred to Bristol just because they um, seem complex or have a serious illness and the provider isn't sure what kinds of things can be done for them. And Bristol will do an evaluation. Um, usually it's the palliative care um, team member, maybe it's the uh, APRN, maybe it's the physician, but they, they can do a um, consultation and they can make recommendations. This person um, is appropriate for hospice and uh, we've talked to them and that's where they want to go. They can make that referral. This HMSA member meets criteria for supportive care. We think we can refer there, um, et cetera. Uh, AIM teams can take over as, as if they were the PCP. So they just take the whole patient and, and manage them, or they can co-manage as a palliative care consult. Uh, for people to come into this program, my understanding is they must be homebound. So they have to meet some uh, criteria for homeboundedness. Uh, they also have this other um, piece of advanced illness management called chronic care management. And they liken this to a geriatrics host, ho house call program. So for those of you who know Rita Bell Fernandez and you know her history, you know that when she was at KKV, she developed a geriatrics house call program, which was very, um, successful. Uh, she, she describes it as kind of like a physician mobile practice. They, come, they get paid for chronic care management um, basically through to traditional billing mechanisms, uh, which is why they can offer this kind of care to other uh, plans like um, United Healthcare. And basically what they do is they bill for home visits. They have 24 seven triage capabilities, but it's all by phone, no in-person during off hours. Next slide, please. At Navian, um, they have an advanced illness care program called integrated care. And uh, I, I think that's where this term came from. <laughs> so um, this integrated care program was launched in 2018 as a pilot. And since that time, I'm told it's been modified. When it first launched, um, it was APRN and LCSW driven. And um, that is largely because um, with the current billing system, only certain disciplines are um, allowed to bill, uh, to submit claims and to get reimbursed. They are physicians, APRNs and uh, LCSWs. Nurses cannot, MSWs cannot, um, chaplains cannot. And as a mechanism to pay for these services, um, these, the, it was initially uh, crafted as an APRN LCSW run program. Since then, they've hired a hospice and palliative medicine board certified physician who's a DO. Uh, and they've included RNs in this now because RNs can work under the um, supervision of an APRN or a physician. They do have after hours availability for triaging and advice. Um, the, in order to come into integrated care, uh, some uh, person has to have functional decline and advanced conditions. Um, they get evaluated and then brought into the program if appropriate for 90 days at 90 days to get reevaluated. If they still meet criteria, they are in for another 90 days. So it's every 90 days they get an evaluation. They use current fee-for-service billing, which means that um, 
co-pays apply and um and you know that so they'll do they'll do billing in the usual submission of claims etc they found that um that was still leaving them a little short so they uh, have a need for charitable giving to help keep this uh, program going. And, and that is a common theme. Um, these pro programs, because the we don't have um, embedded robust mechanisms of reimbursement, um, they struggle to, to stay alive. Next slide, please. There's also something uh, that that most people probably know about, and that is open access or concurrent hospice care. This concept is that um, for people who uh, meet the criteria for hospice care, uh, if they're lucky enough to be in a plan that has uh, open access or concurrent hospice care available, they can also get at the same time all their usual medical benefits. <clears throat> So uh, University Health Alliance, UHA, has had uh, concurrent hospice care for a long time. Now, UHA does not um, cover government uh, insured members. So no Medicaid, no Medicare, no feds. So as a result, they pay for hospice care for their members. And so they can make, they can make whatever determination they want to about who gets covered. Their, um, Population tends to be relatively young um, and relatively healthy. So the population of people who go into concurrent hospice care is by their report small. So they don't even collect data. We have no outcomes data uh, from UHA. The other population of people who can access concurrent hospice care are kids who are uh, insured by Medicaid. So our Quest kids all have this um, benefit. For them, they ha do have to meet the criteria for hospice care. Um, because the hospice is paid for by CMS. Next slide. I don't have any outcome data for the Medicaid kids who access that. So the VA, um, used this concept of concurrent hospice care, I think, and um, melded into it palliative, a palliative care team uh, who are certified and skilled and created this concurrent hospice care uh, for people who are qualified for veterans benefits. The palliative care team makes the evaluation, they create the care plan and they provide the services and they can provide the services in the home. Um, but these, these members must also meet hospice criteria. In usual VA world benefits, um, the, the uh, CMS pays for hospice when they enter into hospice. But in this program, uh, the VA is studying it and they are paying for both the hospice care and the home-based palliative care. Next slide, please. So um, hospice care, just a brief review. Um, hospice care is, it, 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 it's an insurance-based um, care that is covered. It's a medical benefit, okay? All health plans have, have to have uh, hospice as part of their benefits. Hospice, um, people go into hospice when the goal of care is comfort, comfort care. Um, there are strict inclusion criteria because it is a medical benefit. Um, the government set inclusion criteria, including um, certification of a six month prognosis. It requires an interdisciplinary team. Uh, they have to have 24 seven availability and hospice care can be provided in the home, which is basically where most of it is provided uh, at long term care. Uh, at, but it has to be at ICF level of care, not SNF. And there's also inpatient when a person needs um, uh, acute and severe symptom management 
sometimes for um, respite care, things like that. Next uh, slide, please. Okay. So palliative care. What is palliative care? It's specialized medical care. And this definition that I'm sharing with you is probably the only definition that's been actually uh, crafted and studied and put before uh, focus groups, et cetera. So it, it's, it's got some uh, evidence behind its uh, usefulness and uh, effectiveness. Palliative care focuses on providing patients relief from pain and other symptoms of a serious illness, no matter the diagnosis or stage of disease. And I really want to point this out. No matter the diagnosis or stage of disease, very often when we create palliative care programs, in order to get our hands around um, you know, budgets and things like that, we have to put limits on diagnosis, stage of disease or whatever, but don't confuse those marketing, those business decisions with what palliative care actually is, okay? Um, the palliative care teams, uh, they work to improve the quality of life for patients and families. You've heard all of that before. Next slide, please. The team is specially trained, made up of doctors, nurses, and other specialists. They work together. That's why they're called an interdisciplinary team. They don't you know, enter into the chart and walk away. They talk to each other. They update each other. They share concerns with each other and with the patients and families. So it's very interactive, very dynamic. They also work with the other providers, okay? Because the other providers are in there providing <clears throat> usual medical care. Palliative care comes in as an extra layer of support. And it's based on what the patient needs, not on the prognosis. So for those people who say, oh yeah, our palliative care, you have to be like within six months or a year, um, I would, I would, uh, say that, well, that maybe is how you market it, but that is not um, consistent with what palliative care can do and where it can be applied. It's appropriate any stage uh, and any age in a serious illness and can be provided along with curative treatment or um, disease modifying treatment. Next slide, please. So to me, right now, the best example of a home-based palliative care program is supportive care. Um, it is palliative care. It applies palliative care principles applied by an interdisciplinary team. Those teams all have a certified um, physician uh, leading that team or available. There's 24-7 available, either in person or um, by phone. They pay attention to things like care coordination among everybody who is touching that patient, including caregivers. They pay exquisite attention to symptom management. They have been trained in um, communication and so can lead effective shared decision-making um, discussions. For supportive care, you have to meet criteria. That's a marketing thing, that's a budget thing, that's a business thing. Um, that's why supportive care is not everything to everybody that it could possibly be. And supportive care is limited to a 90-day um, period within a rolling 12-month period of time. Next slide, please. So how are hospice and palliative care similar? Because they sound alike, right? They both have an interdisciplinary team. The interdisciplinary team are exactly the same. They support patient and family, excellent pain and symptom management, 24 seven availability in some way, shape or form. So are they the same? Next slide, please. I like to think about things in kind of like geometry. Um, and palliative care is the category of uh, rectangles. Hospice care is a square. It is a rectangle, but not all rectangles are squares, right? So it belongs, hospice care is a subset of palliative care that is applied at the very end of life. Next slide, please. So 
How are they different? Hospice care is covered by all plants. All plants have to have hospice. Palliative care, unfortunately, very variable at this time. Hospice care, applicable at the end of life. Palliative care, any point in a serious illness, potentially. Hospice care, goal is comfort. Palliative care, um, patients, their goals may, uh, may be curing their illness or staving it off as long as is possible. In hospice care, for the most part, the hospice team becomes primary in the care and coordination of uh, that person's care. Whereas in palliative care, the, the palliative care team is responsible for coordinating, but they don't take over all the care. They can't, right? Because the patient may be undergoing treatments and interventions that are beyond the scope of the palliative care team. Next slide, please. So let's get back to Iris, because Iris was very lucky. She had an oncologist who heard about supportive care and early in the days of supportive care for HMSA, she was enrolled. Um, her symptoms became well controlled, so much so that she could sit through and finish her chemotherapy radi and radiation regimen. Um, she was able to live independently again. In fact, when I heard about her, um, she uh, agreed to let me talk to her. And uh, she said, you know, Dr. Seitz, without supportive care, I would be dead already. And, and I think she wasn't exaggerating because she couldn't, she couldn't tolerate the treatments um, that eventually led to her um, getting healthier, feeling stronger, and having over a year of really high quality life. She traveled, she quit her job um, because she wanted to do other things. Um, she became much more engaged in the community. She, she met with her friends. She had a really high quality of life, but you know she had stage four um, cancer. So eventually the cancer kind of reared its ugly head again. At that point in time, she knew who to reach out to. So she called her palliative care team and her palliative care team had um, devised a, um, a uh, method where they called her every month just to check in. How you doing? You know, anything going on? So they kept in touch with Iris. So when she started to get sick again, she reached out to them. She trusted them. Um, and she said, you know, I'm thinking maybe I should have more chemo. So they took her through um, uh, a decision-making uh, discussion. And at the end of the day, Iris said, you know what? I've been there. I've done that. Um, I, I don't think I want to do that anymore. So she said, I, 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 think I, I think it's time for me to go to hospice now. And so she did. She had another couple of months on hospice. Um, and, where, and then and she died peacefully, uh, and having lived her life until the very last day. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, you know, serious illness, think about what that means when you're out there trying to figure out how to do your work and what kind of programs you think we ought to have. It carries a heavy burden for patients, families, providers, and whole communities. The current medical system needs to be changed. It, it just, you and I, you all know it, I know it. It needs to be changed. There are a lot of different models of care. All of them should be tried. All of them should be improved upon. New ones should be thought of. We should be um, experimenting like crazy, innovating like crazy to figure out how to take better care of our people in our communities. Remember that hospice care and palliative care are not the same. Do me a really big favor and um, don't talk about palliative care in terms of end of life care. That just drives me insane. Uh, and Jeanette will know what I'm talking about. Um, hospice care is wonderful. And we are lucky that it is universally available for those at end of life. But some of the choices that have to be made um, in order to access hospice make hospice not the best choice for some people. In my mind, palliative care overall is, for many people with serious illness, best care possible. And that's why um, I am working hard with uh, Jeanette and our other partners in Hui Pohala and, and Kokoa Mau to make palliative care more available 
to the people in our community with serious illness. Next slide. Thank you very much. Um, here's my new uh, address at Hui Pohala. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions or you would like to join us in our efforts. Thank you very much, Ray. So at this point, I would like to open this up for discussion and questions. And um, uh, maybe, um, I don't know if uh, Sarah Tompkinson is, is there still, uh, but I'm just, because I know she needs to leave soon. So I just thought if she wanted to have a comment on this and how, and her experience with this, I think she was at the VA for the longest time. Oh, maybe, she could, um, oh, maybe you can correct whatever I got wrong. Sarah? Naomi. Oh, hi. Thanks, Naomi. Hope had had an interesting yeah. thing. Hope you wanna you wanna talk about uh, Kuku Care? Um, sure. We had um Hawaii Care Choices at one of our last one of our recent um Kuku Amau meetings, and they talked to us about Kuku Care, which they explained that palliative care just doesn't resonate with folks. The term palliative, they don't know what it is. They don't understand it. Um, but kupu care seems to resonate with the, the community at Hilo. And they actually set up a program for kupu care so that they actually get automate, automatic referrals from the hospital. And they have a trigger set. So when the EMRs hit certain things, it's an automatic referral. So it's no longer a, a doctor's referral. They're looking at things that frequent flyers, frequent falls, frequent ER visits, whatever it is that, that will trigger that, that notation saying that they should be visited by Kupu Care and see if they can be supported by the program. So it was really interesting to hear from them. And of course, you know, it's a much smaller community and there's only one hospice there. So that, that kind of worked well for that community um, because we have so many different hospices here on the island. I don't know whether that automatic uh, trigger would work as well. But they've partnered with an organization from the mainland that actually does data collection and they can, uh, they have it integrated into the EMR so that it works well for them. But uh, yeah, the, you know, if I, if I could just kind of comment on that, because you're right, Hope, it's, it's the fact that there's Hawaii Care Choices, you know, and they have a, not only are they the only game in town in Hilo, but they have a really good relationship with Hilo Medical Center. But what, what Hawaii Care Choices did was, I, I believe that they bought into the um, subscription for, what is it called, acclivity or something like yeah, that? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, um, and, and you know, um, so a health plan could do that um, on Oahu for sure, or anywhere. I mean, imagine like a, an HMSA or Aloha Care, for example, you know, if they bought that subscription and put in the data of their membership, then those there would be automatic pop-ups. Um, but I, I don't think that I, I, you know, my my impression is that people should be going to the health plans and trying to get them to buy into that kind of a uh, um, methodology. Okay, so yeah, so I, I see that uh, Jeanette uh, put in a, a link for a Kupu Care that you can watch the video on. And so, um, oh, so Sarah has a question about what is being done to reach our underserved rural communities and communities of color. What a great question, Sarah. And um, Sarah, would you like um, join a group that, uh, that I want to set up? Because here's the thing. Um, I think that um, I would like to see specific attention paid to understanding underserved communities because we don't have comprehensive data that will help us to understand who these people are, how they interact with the medical system or not, um, and where the challenges actually lie in a way that we can set a baseline for ourselves 
create some um, innovations and then track to see how that goes. So one of the things that um, we at Hui Pohala really um, want to work on and do is we want to create a baseline analysis of what is the state of affairs for um, people with serious illness in this state. And we want to be able to break it down by county and, um, and zip code. And personally, I'm really interested in like on the big island because there are huge gaps, um, deserts of service, you know, where people um, are, they're either um, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islanders, other Asians, or they just are living in a rural area that doesn't have much in, in terms of services, you know. Um, but we don't, we, we need to, we need to understand them a lot better. And the data is like so hard to get, man. It's like super hard to get. Um, so we're on a call with a Quest people because Quest wants to have this um, palliative care benefit. And we asked, you know, um, what are you learning about underserved communities? And they're, they're like, we're, we're struggling to get the data. So if anybody's got any ideas for how we can, we can craft the ask or what we want data an to answer for us, and then going to places where we know some of the data exists and beginning to build um, relationships that way. My hope is that we will within the year, I hope, come up with a baseline analysis um, of the greatest needs uh, in, in our state. So thanks for that, Sarah, and please reach out to us. Yeah. <laughs> And definitely, so, so Tori Goodman mentioned Molokai also has limited resources as does, you know, I mean, this is just yeah. a problem. But in the meantime, you know, what are, what, prim what is a primary care doctor supposed to do? Try to figure out, uh, you know, how to navigate where their patients should go. Should they just call their insurance companies as the first step or what is their first step? I, I think I would, as you're talking about providers, who, yeah. where should providers Take this their patients and figure out the options. Yeah, I, I think um, providers, you know, um, I don't know how, and Gary's on the call too, so Gary can, can talk a little bit about this, but there should be um, people within each health plan that the providers can reach out to. Um, at at HMA, HMSA, they were called like provider liaisons or something like that. <clears throat> And, and they may even actually go to their IPA, to their, um, to their physician organizations, because the physician organizations um, should have those connections to the health plans and talk and say, hey, can you guys like come give us an in-service on all, you know, what kind of programs you have and give us information about who to call? Because HMSA has got those, I, I don't work for HMSA anymore, but I know for a fact that they have people who are willing to, um, to share that information and to make the referral processes um, smoother. So um, my advice would be, yes, go to the health plan, see if you, know, you can get um, somebody in member services or somebody who's supposed to be servicing your provider network um, and, and uh, see what you can find out there. Um, yeah. Great. And, and of course, you know, hoping that all service coordinators will eventually, you know, be, be trained. It, you know, I'm just thinking it's sort of almost like a um, for dementia care, right? The no wrong door thing. There should be no wrong door everywhere you go. Everybody should know where to direct you. And no, I think that's correct. I, I think that that is correct. And um, um, at, you know, um, I'm going to, I'm going to say this and, and I'm going to let Toby like knock my block off if I really like am speaking out of turn. But Toby Smith is the medical director for supportive care. So any of the providers out there, um, if they want to do a doctor to doctor call, call him. Because he'll know uh, where to direct people. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Jeanette, do you want to add anything to that? 
So we actually have a, an initiative right now with PMAG of trying to figure out that path to make it easier for the doctors, how the PCP can easily access care. So that's been a really interesting process to learn and getting the feedback from HMSA side. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to um, share that with other groups. I do know that both Hawaii Pacific Health and Queens have um, also have systems in place for the physicians that are connected with them. So some of this comes back to what someone else said, which is the education for the doctors. I think a lot of people like Dr. Seid says, think palliative care is hospice and my patients, oh, they're not that sick. For, so we need to teach people the, the benefit of palliative care, but we also, um, and, and, and get people to understand the differences. And, you know, the thing that Hope mentioned with this screen, it pointed out one of these really important problems that doctors aren't so great at um, talking to their patients about serious illness. So another initiative that Dr. Seitz and I are involved with is um, a vital talk project, which is training physicians to get better at this. And I think, you know, those of us that have been involved with this for a long time, it's always good to remember that these conversations aren't easy. You have to practice. Every family, you have a new chance to have these good conversations, but we can never underestimate that um, you, need, you need good training to have um, conversations about these topics. And um, Gary Okamoto called out the um, MedQuest project. I just want to make people aware of that. And so our MedQuest office Kudos to them. They are really interested in palliative care. They are currently very are, are working on creating a benefit that would be um, available for for MedQuest Medicaid beneficiaries. Gary's referring to a to a session in June. Well, there will be a first time to present to the community what all is going to be involved with that benefit. But this really could be, I think of it as a tipping point where you have such a large group of people who then would have access to this new benefit. Because for us, the challenge is an advocacy one. If you have a health plan that doesn't have palliative care, you know, we need people to be motivated to, to do that. So that's another good thing. Okay, great. So we have one minute left. And so I'm going to Sorry, you're gonna to need to conclude at this point, but I thank you that uh, for everybody's comments. And I, I, I just wanna, I know that uh, Dr. Cohen said five minute visit. Well, emphasize the point that this is interdisciplinary. Everybody needs to be in on the conversation. You know, everybody needs to be supporting each other. It doesn't happen at one time. And we all need to be in communication with between providers and different team members and everybody will hopefully pull us together this is our dream. We'll pull it together someday in our community and everybody will be able to have the right access to the right kind of care at the right time. Uh, that being said, um, I'm gonna conclude here. In order to get your CME credits, there is a web link that is in the chat box. I have, Michaela posted that just a couple of chats earlier and uh, complete that online evaluation. Indicate the type of CE you would like and uh, you know, please put any comments you want for our planning committee for other sessions you would like to see. And then uh, just tune in next month um, for um, dry eyes and older adults. Learn about ophthalmology. Okay, great. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank and thank you, you so much on um, tackling this, this project <laughs> for us. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks, Aida. Okay, great. No, I know it's a it's a lot of stuff people want to cover, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, maybe a longer session with getting some more information. I think you know what keeps coming back to me is that people then will get, oh, that's what palliative care is. Excellent. Okay, we can do this. How do I talk about that? So that would maybe that's another thing to ask Dr. Seitz or some of the team that's doing Vital Talk. To do some of those, yeah. you know, and maybe there's a way to have it longer or more interactive. I don't know. I know this session is good. And Takeshi's done some things, but. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, we can talk about this uh, offline about uh, possibly future sessions that we can uh, include. Thank you. Okay. All right, Good. everybody. Thanks. Bye. Bye.